My collaborators on this project are um, Sean Mahoney, which is a gra he's a graduate student with uh, um, at Northern Arizona University, and Heather Bateman, who's a professor at ASU. Um, Sean and I looked at the bird component, and Heather was looking at the herp component um, um, with the system. We also had um, Rob Dobbs, um, who was with um, Utah Division of Wildlife, and he mainly studied um, these restoration sites on the Virgin, and I'll discuss that later. Um, so one thing that really popped up when the beetle was released and our, our concerns were, what's going on um, as far as the habitat is concerned and how are these birds, going, how is that going to change um, their habitat? And as you can see, right off the bat, we saw that, you know, this, this is um, where there's no defoliation, but as defoliation occurred, you can see this nest highly exposed and actually this bird on a nest in a defoliated area. And so that, that made a big difference and, you know, that sparked, you know, what's going to happen with these birds. This was a southwest willow flycatcher, an endangered species, and um, is it going to affect its productivity and how, how, are these, uh, how are these animals going to adjust to these changes? Um, of course, you know, then we put up a conceptual model. Uh, this is really busy and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but this is a, an example of all the factors that you have to consider. And, you know, Tamaris beetle is just one of them, but all these factors are going to be, um, are, are into play when we're looking at productivity of a species, mostly in our rip riparian system. But if you just look at the Tamaris leaf beetle, you can see that there's going to be um, uh, short-term changes and there's going to be long-term changes. And is it going to increase, for instance, um, population due to, is, going to be, is there going to be a new prey base for this bird? Are these birds, and uh, or are these changes in habitat really going to affect it, and then they're going to decrease per, uh, bird populations? So these are the, these are the, so these spurred some of the questions that we looked at for um, the project that we did on the on the Virgin River. Um, our study site um, is all along the lower uh, the, uh, is is the st started up in the restoration area where we mainly looked at willow flycatchers, and that was in the St. George area. And then um, a lot of the work that Heather and I did and Sean um, was down in the lower area as, as far as in Nevada and Arizona. Um, the beetle um, was released in, two uh, came into the system in 2009, uh, I mean in 2010. In 2009, it was, this was right before and we were able to collect data on, on bird and herp populations before the beetle arrived. The beetle arrived in 2010. There were high um, beetle abundance in 2012, and then lower abundance in 2013. 2013 is when we received another grant that really um, spurred a lot of these questions, that we were able to initiate a lot of this research for 2013 and 2014. So it was this, this variation in beetle abundance really kind of messes with your research. And, and, in, and in turn, then, we, um, it gives you an opportunity to look at these, these, this variation, too. And um, we also wanted to look at others. Uh, uh, there's, there's three obligate tamarisk obligates. And one of them is the leafhopper, um, which is um, described in, two, in 1907, as, and it's a phloem feeder. Um, and then there's, of course, um, the tamarisk leaf beetle, uh, which was introduced in 2001. And then um, there's the um, tamarisk weevil. And, um, again, the talk that discussed yesterday, there's unknown, uh, well, earlier um, uh, um, observations were in 2006, and um, that we were starting to de uh, detect it around 2010 on the Virgin River. So we looked at all three of these, uh, of these um, organisms as far as how, how is this, all, all three of them going to change the dynamics of uh, the avian and herp community. The questions, I mean, so we have three different studies. We have the study that looks at the population level as far as what the patterns of the avian uh, richness and abundance before and after tamarisk leaf beetle, um, the, uh, before and after biocontrol, and the diet study. How does diet um, of the breeding birds differ within and among the areas, um, uh, and are, are, the, are the birds actually eating the beetle? That was another big question. What, 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 how, how do all these tamarisk obligate um, uh, arthropods affect their diet? Are they, what, what's, what's the percentage of them that are really 
taken in, in this new um, food source. Um, as far as the herps are concerned, Heather wanted to look at the re, uh, relate the herpetofauna um, abundance and diversity to changes in the habitat structure due to biocontrol and examine how restoration efforts affect the herpetofauna communities. And then Rob, and then we collaborated with Rob on a lot of this, but Rob started a lot of these projects in 2008, even a couple of years before the beetle arrived. But he wanted to examine year differences in flycatcher use sites and, and uh, related to uh, biocontrol and differences in habitat characteristics between use and use sites and the preference of nest site selection as far as biocontrol is concerned and restoration. Rob started a restoration program right when the beetle arrived. And so there's another factor that plays into this with the willow flycatcher. Um, our study sites consisted of, um, we had two study sites that were 70% tamarisk and 30% native. And that, um, uh, of course, there is this um, aspect of s small pockets of native that are in there. And then our native site was 60% native and 40% tamarisk. And you can see that you have this tamarisk was defoliated and this native right here. And then we had one site that was a, uh, what we called dead tamarisk site, high mortality in Mormon Mesa. And you can see all this uh, mortality in this area, which is completely, um, it's a monotypic tamarisk site, does have an aspect of mesquite but it's um, uh, mainly a high, uh, you know, 70, 80% mortality. And so the first question was, what, what, um, what are the patterns of avian richness and abundance and the tamarisk leaf beetle at the sites that, um, uh, that vary in amount of tamarisk and the amount of defoliation by the tamarisk leaf beetle? Our method to, uh, to look at this was we did point counts for eight minutes and we had um, points that were um, separated at least 200 meters apart. And we, we placed um, points in all the different tab, uh, habitat types. And um, what we found out, there was a lot of variation. So I'm just going to look at two species right now. One of the species was a Lucy's warbler. And we found right off the bat, this is the baseline, this is before um, biocontrol, right off the bat, both in live ta and tamarisk um, in the native mix, we find that there's a dramatic um, a decrease in um, average detections. But then as we go into 2013, which is three years later, after uh, biocontrol um, is, continues, we see that there's a rebound in the native tamarisk mix, but there's still a decrease in the live tammy mix. But then again, 2014, we see this rebound in live tammy and um, a decrease in the native. You can also see there's, these birds are starting to occupy the um, dead tamarisk, which had a mesquite component, and we know that Lucy's warblers uses that mes use mesquite. So there's a lot of variation. This is just a very small picture of what's going on with the avian community, just looking at one species. And then we have the yellow warbler. Of course, 2009 is um, before the beetle, and we see the same trend right after. They're, they're still in the native, and um, they're still in the live tammy. Um, a little bit decrease in 2013 and 2014, but there's a lot of variation to this, and this is something that needs to be further examined. And uh, as far as the li you know, live, uh, the native mix, this bird really prefers a native um, habitat. But it does, it's comparable to the willow flycatcher in some aspects, that it does nest in um, tamarisk. And then what we really um, surprised us a little bit, but I mean, not, not necessarily, but they, we saw this, you know, this is before biocontrol, and then we saw this decrease in um, species richness from 2010 right after, and then it pretty much stabilized in 2013, 2014. So again, we're seeing that there's a decrease in, in the number of species that are occupying, and this is all sites across the board. And so we're seeing this decrease, but what, what this really needs is further study. And then we wanted to look at the diet. And we specifically looked at the Lucy's warbler and the um, yellow warbler. And we looked at all three of the um, riparian obligate um, insects. And then we also looked at um, non-tamarisk obligates. So, there were, so we could see what other species these birds were consuming. And we looked at available in the, habitat, in, in the sites. We looked at what, what, what 
what insects are out there, what arthropods are out there also that are available for these birds to um, consume. And our methods were we use sweep uh, to look at availability, we swept the sites at each point count and where we placed our net, uh, mess nets. And then, um, so this is what we used. We used mess nets to capture the birds. We were capturing a number of other species. We collect, every, every bird that we collected, we collected fecal samples from each bird, placed it in um, um, uh, uh, alcohol, and then um, released the, uh, we banded the birds and released the birds. And so we got another, a number of other species, but these were the two um, common in, um, gleaners that we really wanted to investigate. M these gleaners will go along the branches and they'll eat a lot of the insects that are right along the branch. They're not the birds that are flying after, hawking for, other, um, for the insects. They're mainly just going right along, and that's where the beetles were and a lot of these insects uh, exist. And then as far as identifying we, the method to, we, uh, for identification, we used a dissecting um, uh, scope and um, we identified body parts. I didn't, um, uh, Sean did, and we had another couple of other students and they got really good at it. But you can see, I mean, at this, you can see that this is the tamarisk uh, weevil head. Um, here is an ant, a wasp head, um, a tamarisk leaf beetle leg, um, and a larvae, which we didn't get much of. The larvae are broken down so much before they pass through, and so we didn't get a lot of the larvae. But we did, we were able to identify all, all uh, e each of these body parts, which was very time consuming. And what we found was that, um, which was really surprising, is the red is the leaf hopper, the blue is the adult beetle, and the black is the uh, beetle larvae, and the yellow is the weevil. And what we found in the tamarisk habitat was that um, the tamarisk obligate, obligate um, species, 25% were and 24% of the uh, Lucy's warbler and yellow warbler were, uh, we found weevils in their diet, which was really surprising. We thought, you know, there's gonna be more beetles. And I'll show you the next slide, what's, what was available. And then even in the, uh, in the sites that were um, native, we found the, you know, the same pattern that you know, the adults were a part of their diet, the po adult weevils, but the weevil was definitely a big part of that diet in both um, habitat types uh, compared to the non-tamarisk um, obligate um, diet items. And then this is as far as what the adults were, which was 21% in each one and then a similar pattern in the, um, in the native habitat. And then what we found out was what was available. And so uh, the Lucy's warbler is on the top graph and the yellow war uh, warbler is on the bottom. And you can see what's available is um, what's available is in the red. And as far as the weevil is concerned, there's hardly anything out there as far as available. But they're definitely selecting for that weevil. The beetle is abundant. I mean, as far as what's available out there, but they're not, they're, that's not part of, a big part of their diet and the leafhopper isn't either. And that's the same, well, same type of patterns in the native habitat. We're seeing that the weevil is a, part of the, uh, is a big part of their diet and um, it's hardly, a, it's not even available. I mean, we weren't, cat, uh, we weren't finding them in, in our, in our sweep, um, sweeps at all. But as far as the beetle's concerned, they're, in, they're, they're out there, but they're not being consumed. Leafhopper a little bit more in the native habitat. As far as, um, then I'm going to shift gears here now. So this is um, mostly looking at the HERP data. Um, this is all data that um, Heather Bateman collected um, in the same areas. Um, she ha had her sites that were all the way down to Mormon Mesa, and then she collected sites in the restoration sites up in Utah too. Oh. Okay. So. Um, I'm just briefly, I mean, you know, it'd be great if Heather was here. She couldn't make it. She's on sabbatical right now. But mainly I just want to emphasize what she found as far as lizard abundance. And this was um, pre, this was before the beetle arrived, and then post um, 2011, 2012, and then 2013. And what she was really found was that um, there's, there's definitely a decline in, in, in lizard abundance. And, uh, and this was um, in the summer of 2014, fourth year following biocontrol, had fewer 
captures of individuals. And so there was definitely a decline that she saw in lizard abundance. She also found that as far as activity is concerned, lizard activity was lowest after biocontrol. And so she saw um, this peak lizard activity has shifted after, uh, in post um, uh, biocontrol. And you can see that this change is dramatic um, from where before the beetle and then all the way through um, all her studies um, to 2014. And then um, Heather and, we, and uh, all, uh, we both measured microclimate. And what we looked at, we had um, these uh, data loggers all over in, the, in any, all these sites. And what we found, that there was a decrease in the relative humidity. Um, the relative humidity was at 80%, and we saw a decrease at, to 40% in a lot of these sites, mostly in the dead Tamra sites. And then we saw an increase in temperature um, in a lot of these sites. These minimum temperatures were the one, were the one aspect, the one variable that we really saw an increase in temperature. And then NDVI, we saw these decreases, and NDVI is the satellite imagery, and we were looking at examining um, the amount of greenness. And in the sites that were completely defoliated, we saw a dramatic decrease in NDVI, and even the sites where the native sites, we saw a decrease. Hmm. So now I'm going to shift again to what we found um, up in the St. George area, where um, we mainly emphasized our study on the willow flycatcher. Um, the thing about the beetle was not, the beetle was supposed to come gradually down to where the flycatcher um, was breeding, but after two or three years, it definitely was, um, had invaded those sites and how it was going to affect um, the flycatcher. Um, so in 2008, um, the be uh, after Southwest Willow flycatcher breeding, um, in August, the, uh, the beetle arrived and then was throughout um, in, in June in 2010, June um, in 9 and 10, to, and, and 2011 in late July, and late July in 2012. Um, the one thing that also we had a, fact, a big factor with what was going on with, with the, um, the beetle is that Rob started a restoration program. And it was mainly to, in anticipation of the beetle and how how are they going to, uh, how, what, what do you do with the habitat before the beetle arrives? But he kind of coincided the restoration with the arrival of the beetle. And what his, his, his um, I mean, there was nothing to base on how much do you take out, how much tamarisk do you take out? And what he did was he took 60 to 70 percent of the tamarisk trees out and left a lot of the shrubs. So there would still be some type of, some place for the birds to go until they, um, till the area um, where, where they were planting willow came back. So that, that's, that was his, his whole um, idea of trying to restore these areas, why the beetle was taking a lot of the tamarisk out. And then replant the thinned areas with a mix of native species that provide the understory structure. And what he found out was um, this um, habitat shift between 2009 and 2010. Of course, this is before the beetle. This is right when the beetle arrived. And then you can see this change in the use of tamarisk trees. Now this has it also to do with that restoration began. And he was taking trees out that were greater than eight uh, centimeters. And so you saw this decrease in the use of the big trees. Now we, as far as the willow shrubs, there was an increase because they were planting willow. So you saw before the beetle there was hardly any use and the willow flycatcher mainly uses tamarisk for nesting, but you can see this gradual increase of use of willow. Leaving the shrubs in, the birds still used tamarisk shrubs, less than eight centimeters. So there was still this use of the, of the shrubs before and then after. And then, as we see this, there was this nest substrate shift too. You can see that in 2008, the willows were rarely used. And as restoration occurred and the beetle existed, this increase in the use of willow shrubs, substrates. And with the ta tamarisk substrate still in place, they continue to use the tamarisk as a substrate for, their ne uh, for building nests. And this change as far as um, the, the nest, but the nest, nest, nest success remains low despite the habitat shift. We saw that this is before the beetle arrived, 
this is right when the beetle arrived and you can see one thing that really had a factor was that we had hatch failure and this was due to the exposure to um, the defoliation and probably um, overheating the eggs in the nest. But we saw this, this shift mainly to predation and parasitism after that. And this was mainly that they didn't provide enough cover. And you can see that um, this was reflected in their survival probability, that we saw this major decrease and the survival probability never recovered after biocontrol and after uh, restoration. We then see that um, but the nest success in the habitat was mainly due to the willow. I mean, as far as that introduction of the willow, we're seeing still success was lower in the willow and there was a high type of failure, but we still, still see that the success is in that tamarisk and there's low and it's still failed, uh, uh, limited failure in the tamarisk. The, the thing is, so within in 2013, we added another species. And what we did, we, we looked at you, um, willow flycatcher, but we also added yellow warbler, which is comparable to the um, willow flycatcher as far as um, uh, breeding biology and, and what habitat they occupy. They do occupy more of a native, but they will breed in, in native. But what we saw was finally 2013, we saw a rebound in apparent nest success and um, we saw a decrease in parasitism and predation. But we saw this huge uh, decrease in uh, nest success um, in the yellow warbler and high number of um, uh, nest parasitized. So you, it was really good that we started looking at another species. In 2014, which I don't have that data right with me, but we saw the yellow warbler rebound a bit and the willow flycatcher still stabilized. So uh, we've got to look at a number of species to actually see what's going on. Heather found that um, as far as the uh, restoration sites, she found that all in the TAMI there was um, changes as, as far as between 2013 and 2014 were limited in all these sites, but in the restored site that um, we, we saw this in increase, but then in 2014 a decrease. So there's a, still a lot of variation as far as lizards are concerned too. So these studies are very small windows to actually examine what's going on. Um, and then, you know, the, since there was a dieback of 54% volume, then we're going to see those other uh, weeds come in and we saw arrowweed and uh, kosher come in. Next slide. And we can see that, oh, back. You can see this where there's hardly anything but all this kosher is starting to come in in 2014. And then um, as far as restoration, the value of the uh, tamarisk habitat is dynamic and complex. Um, other non-native community members can increase uh, and the value of the tamarisk for, the, for native species. If tamarisk habitat is removed without restoration, the food may be removed as well and can decrease the value of the natives. So that's another factor you really have to take when, we, when we're doing restoration. And re recommend investigating phenomena in tamarisk and habitat prior to the management efforts. Next slide. Um, and then as far as protect the current breeding sites, as far as willow flycatcher and a lot of these species, large scale restoration in vicinity of current breeding sites and time scale is huge as far as beetles are affecting the breeding sites now. So this restoration has to start now. Other uh, flycatcher uh, breeding areas, restoration enhancement should start several years in advance, such as what's going on on the Gila River in Arizona. Next slide. And this is um, all the people that were involved in this. Um, of course, all the organizations that were helpful. Uh, uh, the Walton Foundation was a, one of these um, organizations and the LCC projects were uh, a, a huge contributor. Thank you. So we have time for one quick question, but Matt will be around to answer.